Welcome back to our daily devotions. It's been my privilege over the past couple weeks to do some of these with you. And today I want to talk to you about 2 Chronicles 7, 14 and the church. This is a really popular verse. You've probably seen it on Facebook if you're on Facebook at some point in time or a different social media platform. Maybe you've seen it even on a, a coffee mug or something like this. I want to go ahead and, and read it for you right now the verse says if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways then i will hear from heaven and i will forgive their sin and i will heal their land that that sounds awesome that sounds uh, just what we need right now uh, as uh, a nation and and even worldwide uh, that, that just sounds great but I fear that many times we take this verse out of context. And although we're going to see today, it, it is relevant for us. Uh, we need to, to be careful in how we uh, do our work of study and the scriptures. Uh, so I just want to give you a little bit of context to what was going on in Second Chronicles chapter 7. Solomon had just... Uh, finished building the temple and then dedicating that temple to the Lord. Uh, the Lord appears to him by night and essentially affirms that he uh, indeed accepts this temple that Solomon had built. And then he reaffirms uh, promises that, that he had made to the people of Israel many times before, reaffirms these uh, covenants with uh, Solomon and the people of Israel. And, and, and as he's talking about it, Second Chronicles seven fourteen, it starts: "If my people who are called by my name, if my people are called by my name, we have to ask ourselves who are the the people being uh, referred to here." As you say, the context is clearly referring to the, the people of Israel. Now, you might ask, isn't uh, the church also called the people of God? And you would be right in uh, that statement. Second Peter uh, chapter or First Peter rather, chapter two, verse nine. Uh, says this about the church uh, and certainly there are similarities uh, between the New Testament church and the Old Testament Israel uh, we serve the same unchanging God uh, many of the instructions in the Old Testament are uh, the same or very similar to the ones that we see in the the New Testament but there's also some key differences that we have to know we have to note that that never does the New Testament refer to the church as this, this new Israel, as some um, have stated. Uh, we never see that. In fact, the Bible talks about, in Romans chapter 11, uh, there being a, a future for the people, the ethnic people of Israel. We also realize we're not under the same law. The people of Israel were under the, the Mosaic law. The New Testament clearly says that as Christians, we are set free from that to live uh, by the Spirit. Uh, the promises of Israel were directly tied to their obedience to the Mosaic law. You can find this in, in Deuteronomy chapter 28, that they were promised blessing if they obeyed, but promised cursing if they Disobeyed. So as we come into the, this passage, we begin to, to read it, we have to remember the context. We have to remember what is going on. We have to remember that, that there are certainly similarities between the New Testament church and Old, the Old Testament Israel, but that does not mean that these groups are the same. Uh, God, God is working through the church in this age, and there are certainly things that uh, we can learn from this passage, but we ought to be uh, very careful as we come into this and see, okay, what did this mean back then and now what does that mean for us today going back to the verse it says if my people who are called by my name humble themselves that sounds like a good idea and pray that sounds like a great idea and, and seek my face and and turn from their wicked ways then i will hear from heaven and i will forgive their sins uh that sounds awesome this text must surely be directed towards us well, I would argue not necessarily. Again, remember the immediate context. Who is the Lord talking to? The Lord is talking to Solomon. And the Lord is uh, more broadly reaffirming what he has already told to the people of Israel. 
So I'd say this text is not directed towards us, but there are elements that relate to us. What do I mean by that? Well, <clears throat> think about Romans 15 verse 4. It says, For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of scriptures, me, we might have hope. So, so what are these Old Testament passages for, specifically these narratives for? Uh, what, what, how, how do we apply them? Well, I believe they're there, according to Scripture, for an example for us. They're, they're an example of, of the character of God, how, how God works with people. Uh, also, what we, we should realize is that, that many of these same principles we find in this example are then repeated to us in the new testament i think about james chapter 4 verse 7 through 10 says submit yourselves therefore to god resist the devil and he will flee from you draw near to god that sounds a lot like seeking the face of god and he will draw near to you cleanse your your hands that sounds a lot like turn from your wicked ways cleanse your hands you sinners Purify your heart to you, double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourself before the Lord. That's what Second Chronicles 7 says. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. So there's a lot to learn from the Old Testament, but that is laid out to us as an example. There's a lot to learn specifically from these narratives, but that doesn't necessarily mean that all the things said in the narratives are directed at us as Christians. We don't read the narrative of Noah and say, I'm going to go out and build an ark because that's what God wants me to do. No, we understand that that's an example of Noah's faith, and we want to follow that example of faith. We don't uh, read the narrative of Joshua and go look for Canaanites to attack. No. Uh, you know, in Joshua, we see example of faith and obedience as well, and we, we follow those examples. Uh, so, so we see much of this text is, is, is great, and it's uh, all of this text is great. Much of it is, is laid out for an example for us, and we would do well to follow this example. But I want to touch on the, 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 the ending part of this text, because I think this is significant. It says, If my people, who are called by my name, humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive Sins. We see just about all those principles in the New Testament, right? But think about this last part. And I will heal their land. And I will heal their land. Again, context is key. Uh, God is talking specifically to the people of Israel. They had been promised blessing for obedience. They had been promised cursing for disobedience. And they had also been promised the land. And this promise for land goes all the way back to the book of Genesis. So first mentioned in Genesis chapter 12. Uh, God gives the specific of the land in Genesis chapter 15 uh, to Abraham. So what's the problem? Well, the problem is that this verse many times gets ripped out of its context, where suddenly Christians become the people that this verse is talking about, and then America becomes the land that it's talking about. Well, what's the problem with that? Well, God never promised Christians to that peace and prosperity here in america that's never promised to us in scripture we are we are blessed by god to, to have the the freedoms that that we have but that is not necessarily promised uh, to us we we have been promised a land as christians but that's not america uh, that land is heaven and that is the land that we should be putting our hope in uh, she also knows this verse calls for a national repentance not simply the repentance of a faction of the nation such as the church uh, so God is in no way bound by this we can't take this verse out of its context and say say okay now if, if we as a church just just pray then God has to bring peace and he has to bring prosperity uh, to the church in America that would be taking that out of context and we can think about nations that are under persecution uh, I've seen videos recently um, the underground churches in China that have been, been broken into and b believers have been dragged uh, out of uh, their services. Uh, I'm sure those those churches in China are, are, are praying and seeking the face of the Lord, yet the truth is as believers many times 
uh, we will face persecution and the hope that we have in the midst of that is not in America it's not in any of these surrounding uh, earthly physical things but the hope that we have is found in our Savior Jesus Christ that hope is found in heaven uh, so second Chronicles 714 uh, has a lot of truth for us now and you might ask might, might God heal America if the, if the church truly prayed uh, and sought the face of the Lord he might uh, we see uh, Nineveh as an example of a, a, a nation that repented and, and sought the face of the Lord and, and God spared them of his wrath. Uh, so we certainly should be applying many of these principles. We should be in prayer. We should, as a church, be seeking the face of the Lord and, and, and humbling our, ourselves and, and, and turning from our sin and, and turning to him. So my hope and my prayer that, that during this time is that you would be doing it not so that we can live a, a peaceful and prosperous life, but rather because our hope is found in God. Our hope is found in Christ. Our hope is found in the eternal home that he has promised us. And we can take confidence as we move forward in that.